Hey everybody and welcome to our next Northeast Cambridge AAP session. Um, I hope you're all okay tonight. We've been having some uh, technical issues so I'm sure that we'll get through it okay. Um, this is the sixth of our eight series of topics for the consultation for a North East Area Cambridge Action Plan um, and we've got a panel tonight for you talking around design and density. Um, just I'll pick up on some housekeeping topics afterwards um, just to let you know the format of the evening. We're going to do a little presentation for you with colleagues and then there'll be a chance for you to ask some questions. We've had some pre kind of inputted questions um, already so we'll kind of pick up on those as well. When we don't have enough time to answer all of them we will be available on the website and we'll put answers on there over the next few days. Um, as usual caveat with some of this stuff it is a live digital event so this is a busy time of the evening if people do drop out please bear with us um, because we will be trying to kind of tag team and answer questions where we can we do know some people's bandwidth does tend to drop out um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to introduce or going to let the, the team introduce themselves and go around the panel um, and then we'll pick up on some housekeeping issues so if I can ask firstly John to introduce himself Yes, hello, good evening. I'm Jonathan Brooks. I'm Principal Urban Designer in the Greater Cambridge Shared Planning Service and I've been working on the North East Cambridge Area Action Plan for uh, quite a significant amount of time looking at design um, and kind of character and the kind of place we want to create. Thanks John. Sarah? Hello everybody, um, I'm Sarah Chubb, I'm a Principal Urban Designer also at uh, Greater Cambridge Shared Planning Service and um, I've also been working on the North East Area Action Plan in the background on some design related um, areas. Thanks Sarah. Hannah? Hi everybody, I'm Hannah Loftus, I'm Special Projects Officer at the Greater Cambridge Shared Planning Service as well. Um, and I work mainly on the community engagement and communication side of things. So we've been involved with really spreading the world about the webinars and, you know, developing kind of some of the vision and so forth with the community. Thanks, Hannah. I, we've also got uh, my colleague Terry D'Souza here. He's not actually visible at the moment because I think he is initially having some technical issues, but he's one of our principal policy planners and hopefully he'll be available by the time we get to the question and answer session. And obviously this isn't just us, we've got a really good team working behind the scenes to make sure that we've got this webinar coming to you reasonably, um, reasonably expedited. Um, so what I want to do is just cut, touch on a couple of housekeeping issues. Um, the session's being recorded, so it'll be available on both the City Council and South Cambridge District Council websites, YouTube channels and social media after the session who, for those who can't make it. Um, you all, as in the attendees, not us, the panel, you're all invisible, which is quite strange because I feel like I'm just talking to my colleagues. So you, you know, you're not in view, so you know, feel free to you know, say what you need to say. Um, and you can also post anonymously or you can choose to leave your name. It, it hasn't got a chat function, we've got a question and answer at the bottom, so we'll see that as we go through the, um, as we go through the presentations. Um, I think that's pretty much it. I've realised I forgot to introduce myself. So my name is Paul Brainer and I'm the Assistant Director for Strategy and Economy within the Greater Cambridge Shared Planning Service. Um, and now what I'm going to do is hand over to Hannah Loftus, who's going to take us through the presentation and um, then we can ask some questions afterwards. Thanks, Paul. So I think Joe's going to share the slides. We just thought we'd give you a quick run through because we know that some people are more familiar than others with the kind of context for the area action plan. Um, as everybody I'm sure is aware, you know, it is a really significant project for Greater Cambridge as a whole. Um, it's um, 182 hectares of brownfield land in an amazing area for transport accessibility, which I know will be appearing on your screen shortly. Um, and, you know, it, it is really a once a generation opportunity, we feel, to create a really special part of Cambridge, a really special part of the city and also meet some of the pressing needs of our communities as well. So um, one of the things that is obviously the driver for the area action plan, uh, Joe, are you able to, sorry, is that coming up the, the um, slide? Because I just want to be able to point to things on the, on the map. Um, 
So, well, one of the drivers is that the, the site isn't all owned by one person um, and it's owned by a series of landowners. So we really need an area action plan as a planning framework to help us um, to help us shape the vision and, and bring all the landers along with us to a shared vision uh, for the area. It's a complicated area, as, as people know, it has the current, oh here we are, brilliant, thank you. Um, it has the current Anglian water wastewater treatment plant and the idea is that that will be moved and as I'm sure you're aware there's a consultation that they're running at the moment as to where that may get moved to. Um, and it really is a, a strategically important location, but it is also about local communities. Some of the communities around North East Cambridge are some of the most deprived in our area. And really there is a kind of levelling up agenda here as well about saying, well, it's got to work not only strategically for us, but also for local communities. Next, please. So yes, so Area Action Plan very quickly is sort of equivalent in status really to a local plan. So it's a very significant document and it goes with a very extensive evidence base of studies and topic papers, which you can read on our website. It also goes through the same examination process as a local plan would do with an independent planning inspector. So this isn't a plan that will get adopted next month or even probably next year. It is a quite a lengthy process, but it is all the more weighty and, and kind of important for that because of course the more uh, more significant the plan, essentially the more thorough of the process it needs to go through. Next please. So this is the vision that we are consulting on during this consultation and as you can say it really is around this idea of what is a 21st century low carbon city district, that it's got to be walkable, that it's got to have this really genuine mix of uses so everything that you want is on your doorstep and it's also got to be integrated with the surrounding neighbourhoods so that it's not a kind of uh, an inward facing place, it's very much an outward facing place that engages with its surroundings. Next, please. Just a few headline figures. So at the moment there are 15,000 jobs across the science park, business parks and the industrial areas, but only three homes in fact within the AAP boundary, which is kind of amazing. So there's a clear opportunity here to get more homes in a place where there are already lots of jobs. And we're also looking at adding and intensifying that employment use here too, because it's so accessible by all forms of transport. So it is 8,000 homes, which we estimate will provide homes for about 18,000 people. The target is that 40% of those will be genuinely affordable. Um, and that's kind of unpacked a bit more in terms of what that means. We actually did a webinar on housing the other week, which you can have a look at, but essentially that's social rented homes, council rented homes, as well as shared ownership and other sort of intermediate types of affordable housing. Um, and there's a huge amount of green space and public open space that will come alongside that 10 hectares of kind of major public parks and squares and that doesn't even count the smaller neighbourhood spaces and also the retained spaces There's nearly nine hectares of retained green space that already exists on the site that are going to be protected and enhanced as part of this. Next please. So on to the theme of today's webinar. You know, it is very much a placemaking and a design led plan. This has been the, the, the important part of this from the outset. It's not starting from a position of, of numbers and so forth. It's starting from a position of what kind of district do we want to make? What's its identity? What's its character? And how can that contribute positively to Cambridge as a whole? And it is a really ambitious plan. And I'm sure John and Sarah will talk about this a bit more because, you know, I think it is it is stepping beyond some of the things that have been done in the city to date. It is obviously bigger than a lot of the other development sites that we've had uh, come up over recent years. And it is more ambitious in terms of pushing what people-centred design really means. What does it mean to design a place where the car isn't king, where people and walking and cycling and green space are really, you know, some of the key drivers here. Next, please. Something we do talk about in the team is that all the buildings we all love now from the past were all new once and really we want to be building the heritage of the future. We want to be creating spaces that your children and grandchildren, great grandchildren will be really proud of in years to come. So it is about saying that this proud tradition of outstanding architecture must continue at North East Cambridge. Cambridge has this incredible reputation nationally and sometimes when I talk to colleagues in other authorities and in other areas they are so jealous that we get to work in Cambridge with all these fantastic projects that we get to work on in terms of their design quality. So it is about meeting that high bar um, as far as we possibly can and then putting in place the policies that support that. Next. 
There are a few policies which you can comment on in the draft area action plan, which specifically deal with design. So policy six sets out the overall kind of placemaking vision here and shows and it says how we expect developers to demonstrate how they've responded to Cambridge itself and to the qualities of Cambridgeshire as a place in developing their design. So that's a really kind of clear expectation that we're not assuming that developers will have done it. We're saying to them, you need to show us and tell us and take that take us through that story about how you have looked at your context for your project and developed something in response to that. Um, it also goes through some of the, the really kind of important principles about natural surveillance and active frontages and safe spaces, as well as also saying we want to use a quality review panel to help us assess what good design means in North East Cambridge. So that's a panel that there are, there are several design panels in the area, but the, the basic principle is that we use the quality review panel of experts, of other designers and architects, it's a kind of peer review system to say, well, actually, is this meeting our aspirations and how could it be made better? As I mentioned, mix of uses is really key. And again, this is something that is a little bit different from some of the kind of developments that you might be familiar with, because it is about saying that homes and workplaces, shops, schools, even some light industrial activity can coexist really happily. This is a, an image from the typology study, which is actually a really great document for those of you interested in, in design and so forth. And that's on our website as well in the document library, which is showing how, you know, schools don't have to look just the same as a kind of school in a sea of playing fields actually you can have really inventive design solutions that use the space really well create that active mix of uses mean that there aren't spaces that are just used nine to five and then are dead for the rest of the time and it is also about making the district more sustainable legible streets and spaces is key and again the policy, the, there's a policy that's all about how streetscape design is working and I thought we'd just take you through this in a little bit more detail because I think it's one of the things that we hope will make North East Cambridge really special. It's not only that the network is really legible so it's easy to navigate, you don't get lost, you don't need a map to get around, you can kind of tell where you're going very naturally, um, that the street furniture, the lighting and signage and so forth is really great that of course it's inclusive to people who have different mobility needs and all of that. And of course that trees, street trees, we just know how important they are, not just from a design perspective, but also from a climate change perspective. But it is also about saying we take a really different approach. So the primary streets where vehicle traffic will have through routes are one type of street, but most of the streets will be what we're calling secondary streets, which are absolutely designed around people and cyclists first and most of them won't be through routes so they are pushing home this message that this is people first and cars well not even second but definitely down the user hierarchy next so these are just a few images that we put together to de demonstrate some of the principles of the streets in design terms the primary streets will have segregated pedestrian and cycle routes that are separate from the vehicle traffic that makes them really safe because these will be the through routes for buses and for deliveries and other vehicle movement but even so they're going to be great places they will incorporate trees they will incorporate sustainable urban drainage features which is also obviously a green feature um, and they will also incorporate areas for the ground floor activities of shops and cafes and so forth to spill out all of the streets will be designed to a design speed that's below 20 miles per hour as well. Next. I think what most of our team get really excited about are the secondary streets where we're taking what's known in the continent as a kind of bono approach to streetscape. That basically means that you're naturally slowing down all of the vehicle traffic to nearly walking speed through the way that the street is designed. And that means that you suddenly create space for informal play, for socialising, for all sorts of other things to happen in the street to make that a really active and lively community centre. So you can see some of the kind of principles here that you could have doorstep play, that you have lots of cycle parking. You will have blue badge parking if you're a blue badge holder, but other people won't be able to park at their front door because that's part of trying to make these really car free streets. So, you know, we're really excited about this. And the next slide, which Joe, maybe just move on, shows just a couple of examples of how this works in other places. And you can see the kind of really different sort of streetscape that can be created. It's not banning cars. Cars can still come if they're needed, if you've got a good reason, a delivery or so forth coming. But it is about putting people first 
making that a really amazing urban environment that feels safe and green and people centred. Next. So those sort of apply to both slightly higher density streets where you might have a mix of use and also the medium density streets which will be primarily residential and again having space for front yards where people can sit out, um, different kinds of play and opportunities. We will have last mile deliveries looking to try and encourage cargo bike deliveries as far as possible. So it is about creating an, a, an environment that goes really beyond the car and looks to what the future should be like. I know some people are very interested in the approach to height, building heights and scale and massing. And if you've got comments on that, please comment on policy nine, which sets that out in a bit more detail. But the approach here is really to say that whilst it is a bit denser than what you may be used to in some of the old parts of Cambridge, it is very much a stepped approach. It is not a one size fits all approach here. So around the edges, you will be having four to five stories typical. That's the kind of green areas on the map. And then the yellowish areas, maybe five to six, six stories, typically the red six to eight and then the purple, which is the district centre. So that's really the heart of the district where, you know, the main shops and so forth will be could be a bit taller than that, which might be seven to 11 stories, typically. And a landmark building there we think could go up to 13 stories. This has been looked at really carefully by the team in terms of the wider views and heritage impacts and so forth and we are doing more work on that as well at the moment. What that has shown us is that really if you are building slightly taller and slightly more densely in the middle of the site that doesn't have an impact on views from the surrounding area to a negative degree so you know we're quite confident that we've got an approach here that will create a sense of place, a sense of buzz in the middle, but will also step down appropriately to the edges. The next. It's really important that we sort of understand the density question. And, and again, this shows it in dwellings per hectare, which can be a little bit difficult to understand, but that's essentially a kind of ratio of, of the number of homes you may get. Obviously a home can be a one bedroom home, a two bedroom home or a three bedroom home. So it's a bit of a rough measure. But just as a, as a comparison, it is about creating and using, using that land effectively to create sustainable neighbourhoods, because we know that that leads to less, low densities lead to more car use and absolutely do not sustain local shops and services as well. And I think an interesting comparison is that the kind of mansion blocks and so forth in Notting Hill are typically around 250 to 300 dwellings per hectare, which is pretty much the same as what we are planning for most of North East Cambridge. So this is definitely not high rise in the sense that some people might be worried about. This is about an urban area and it is about somewhere that will feel like a city, but it's not somewhere that is kind of the next Canary Wharf, if you like, De definitely not landing in North Cambridge. It is, it is a very gentle density. Next. So this image shows the kind of typical scale for most of the buildings, this kind of five, six storey approach. And we are doing more work on this at the moment. And if someone wants to know more about this, please do put a question in the Q&A about it as well, because I'm sure John or Sarah would be happy to go into that bit more detail. Next. And this is just a little comparison to show that the 13 storey building, which is in orange, is actually lower than the top of King's College Chapel so you know whilst it is taller than a two or three storey terrace house for sure it is not that out of scale with some of the buildings that we are actually used to seeing and used to loving in the city and it is really about making them as well designed as they possibly can be so that the taller buildings feel like really celebratory landmarks. And these are just a few examples again from our typology study of the sort of architecture and design we'd really like to encourage you know that they are buildings that feel like they're permanent that they're made to last that they're made from great quality materials and most importantly they have the right kind of shared green spaces and public spaces for people to be able to enjoy so we've had a few questions that have been recently asked on social media and so forth that we're just going to go through with the team now and we also had a couple come in via email just this afternoon which didn't make it into this powerpoint but we'll we'll come on to them after these ones so first question is, is really just this question about why are we building so high and so dense in, in these proposals or what's, what's the story behind that? I think, is it John who's going to answer this one? I can't remember who we... That's me. 
Oh, I'm Terry, apologies. Uh, yes, sorry, I didn't introduce myself earlier. I've had connection issues, but yes, hello, I'm Terry D'Souza, um, Principal Planning Policy Officer. Um, okay, so uh, why are the buildings so high in uh, so high and so dense in the draft plan? So um, as Hannah sort of mentioned in the presentation, they are a bit higher and a bit denser than some of the older parts of Cambridge, but they aren't actually that tall. Um, and that diagram sort of tried to um, show how, how that compares with other buildings in Cambridge at the moment. Um, it would be quite similar to the sort of heights that we're seeing in places like Eddington and Great Nineton and, and so forth. Um, and the typology is work that we've done. It looks at places as well like Paris and Amsterdam and that where your typical sort of historic blocks are kind of six to seven storeys high. Um, and they don't particularly feel overdeveloped because of one, the quality of the design uh, and the streetscape. Um, and also just thinking about, you know, the space between the buildings uh, and, and the kind of the quality of the architecture as well. But, but I think we also just need to think about um, about the fact that, you know, this is an edge of Cambridge site um, and there's, you know, there's great opportunity here to, to kind of optimise um, sort of development in, in this area um, based on those kind of sustainable transport modes and things. Uh, it's, it's a brownfield site and, you know, this, this really provides the opportunity for people to live on the edge of Cambridge um, close to existing jobs uh, and, and, and new jobs um, and the services and facilities within the city centre. Um, so we really think that we could create somewhere that's that's livable, um, that is kind of unique in its own way, that has its own character. Um, so th there's lots of opportunity here. I think high density living, there, there's quite a negative perception around high density living, but you know um, there are there are a lot of benefits. So when you think about um, you know people will be living closer to their neighbours uh, and also their workplaces. There'll be higher levels of social interaction um, and also um, more people actually helps to um, helps to support um, other new infrastructure coming in as well. So, for example, sustainable transport, um, schools, public spaces, the more people there are, the more people that will use those facilities, the, the more kind of um, the more of a business case there is really to, to actually um, put those services in in the first place. Um, we see with a lot of new housing estates where, you know, you, you might get a bus for the first two years that's funded by the developer, but because they're built at much lower densities, actually those bus services don't become viable in the long term and then the bus service goes. So everybody then ends up jumping in their car. So, you know, with a development like North East Cambridge and hopefully something like that won't happen. Thanks, Terry. That's, um, I think, thanks, Terry and Hannah, and for, for both of the presentations. I think we've got another question. I think I'd like just to reiterate, really, some of the pieces that um, Hannah has said, and Terry. I mean, we are actually really excited by this. I mean, it's, it, it's something to be celebrated, I think. So, you know, we want to get it right. So please get your comments in now. I can only see one question so far, and there's 22 of you. So let's get some more questions here for the team, please. Um, so won't people be crammed into tiny flat, John? I thought, I think that's for Sarah. Yeah, I'm going to, if that's okay, I'm going to pick up this one, Paul. Um, absolutely not. People won't be crammed into tiny flats. Um, there's national space standards uh, for the minimum size of homes and the draft policy in the AAP, we expect um, uh, applicants to actually exceed uh, these standards. And these are great standards um, and they're not just covering floor area, but they're also covering floor to ceiling heights. And that's to ensure that we want these flats and these apartments and these homes really to feel really spacious. And, and I've just touched upon that they will be mostly flats, but they're going to be really well designed. Um, and and we're, we're, we're confident that these are going to be great places to live for everybody, not just young people, for families, downsizers, everybody really. They're going to be accessible. Uh, flexible and adaptable and they're going to have great balconies so we're not just thinking about sort of small uh, 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 balconies where you can have small uh, tables and chairs we're thinking about roof terraces um, and, and, and generous spaces that everyone can kind of sit out and, and, and enjoy um, privately so we're really thinking um, about a more continental sort of way of living and we're excited about that and um, we're also excited about the fact that we're creating a compact place um, where you, you've effectively got everything, you can have everything on your doorstep. Um, and like Terry mentioned, you know, bringing people closer together in well-designed places and well-designed homes can create that and foster that sense of community. So absolutely no crowing here. Thanks, Sarah. Sorry, I got that one 
I'm wrong. Um, yeah, we've got another couple of pre-prepared questions and then we're starting to see some questions come through. Um, so this is more of a comment. This isn't gonna feel like Cambridge anymore. So I think this one is for you, John, isn't it? This is, thanks, Paul. I mean, I, I think this is a really crucial point, actually, and, and I know it's a statement, but it is a kind of worry that people have when you start to add a development of this size to something as kind of precious and unique as Cambridge. There is clearly a concern um, that it might be harmful. Um, I think what's really important is to kind of think about what are some of those kind of key characteristics of Cambridge. So it's a walkable place. It's got a really kind of compact core. People have really good access to green space and to the countryside. And I think it was the Holford plan in 1950 said it's one of the few cities in England that you could cycle home for lunch. And yeah, it gives a really kind of rich picture about the kind of place, the kind of unique character of the city. When we think about this as a new place, well, we're absolutely kind of going for a compact, walkable place that actually I think is rooted in those kind of key traditions of Cambridge. We thought about access to green space and to the river, um, which is again, a really important kind of characteristic. And then as we think about kind of Cambridge's character as an evolved place, you know, those buildings have been reused and repurposed over the years. We're thinking of policies within the plan, which will talk about how these new buildings can be adapted and changed to meet uh, future needs. Again, you know, the idea of a kind of fine grain place, a human scale place. Um, and I think, you know, all of these things kind of line up to kind of help create a good framework for something that understands the character of Cambridge, but actually can deliver something which is exciting and kind of new um, and can meet and resolve the current kind of concerns and issues that we're all facing, things around kind of climate change, about work-life balance, about moving towards and actually embracing low car dependency, and importantly, a kind of really inclusive place. Um, so I think it's a kind of, it's an exciting chance to add something to Cambridge, um, but it's really kind of crucial it's done in a context sensitive way. And, and some of the things that Hannah talked about in terms of the HIA, the heritage impact assessment, the visual impact assessments, and all of these other things, and the requirements for subsequent developments to do undertake these processes as part of their planning application, I think is how we create the best possible chance to create something that is of now, but is also of Cambridge. Thanks, John, that's great. And I think, um, on my understanding, that's the, there's the, we've got a few more questions to come through that we have had through emails, but we'll start picking up some of your questions now live so i'm going to go firstly to the first question um will each of the blocks of the flats have its own outside space garden for residents and yes sorry my uh, internet is playing up again so i'm going to turn my video off so hopefully you can still hear me um, that's a really good question. It's something that we picked up on in the open space and biodiversity webinar that we had uh, about 10 days ago. Um, so uh, what, uh, what, we're, what we're proposing is that each of the flats will have uh, private amenity space. So that is in the form of balconies for the flatted developments. Um, but one of the key things is that um, with flatted developments, it also allows you to, to have kind of those communal spaces. So they will be those that are accessible um, to the residents within that block. So you can think about things like courtyards or um, po uh, podium terraces uh, and also roof gardens uh, uh, as well. Um, there are a few examples in the uh, presentation that I gave on the um, open space um, Q&A session that, that sort of gives you a bit of a flavour of what they may look like. But essentially, yes, there, there will be there will be outside spaces and gardens for residents, um, as well as those kind of um, open public open spaces as well, which uh, Hannah's mentioned in, in the presentation. So those kind of um, the, the linear park uh, and larger open spaces and the neighbourhood ones as well. Just in case you didn't catch the original question there, I'm just going to read it out back again because I know Paul's audio dropped out, which was 
will each block of flats have its own outside space or garden for residents? And I think the other thing to add is they will also have private space. So we have a minimum standard for, as Terry was mentioned, or I think as John was mentioning, for um, balcony sizes. So a minimum balcony size for each, each flat will be provided. So you'll not only have your shared space, but you'll also have private outdoor open space per flat. Just going to pick up the next question here, which is, can we comment on the need for lifts in high rise and the problems with one person per lift in high rise buildings recently? So this is a really topical question with COVID of recently. And we do understand where this concern is coming from. I think there's so two answers to this. Firstly, I think the, the perception of kind of high rise is something that we want to unpick a little bit because you know we aren't talking about buildings where we've got many many floors above what would be considered a kind of walkable level so we are going to make sure that buildings have really great stair provision um, although I hate to mention Grenfell we know that after Grenfell there's an increased amount of awareness on actually making stairs really safe and really good quality environments from lots of perspective so you do have options you don't have to use the lift um, and I think, you know, this is one of these issues where we are having a watching brief on COVID. COVID has brought some of this stuff up that just wasn't on our radar until this year. And we have a watching brief for COVID on a lot of levels. We know there may be economic changes. We've talked about working from home. We actually think that NEC is really well placed for a lot of this stuff because the whole idea of having a mix of uses and that you might have neighborhood workspaces where, you know, co-working spaces and so forth, where you can go locally or not having to get in public transport and travel long distances is great. But I think this is something that we're going to review and I wouldn't be surprised if there comes out new guidance over the next year about lifts. And of course, we'll take that on board in the design process as it goes on. Thanks. Thanks, Anna. Let me know if my, um, my team, I'm sure, will let me know if my audio drops out again and we will tag team it slightly. I'm um, going to move on to question number three that I've got on my list about is um, with an improved and subsidised better public transport system, how are um, discussed? Is that Paul dropped, Paul dropped out again? Yeah. 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 So how, how are we discouraging? Car owners oh, Sorry, Paul. How are we discouraging car owners from getting about? Uh, I think that's a really good question. Um, that's something that uh, we will we will probably go into more detail on during the uh, connectivity uh, Q and A webinar that's coming up over the next week or two. But just to to think about it in terms of the design sort of context of of this webinar, it's it really starts with the street design. Now, I think as Hannah showed in the presentation, it's you know we are creating we're creating streets at Northeast Cambridge. We're definitely not creating roads. Um, we want we want those kind of spaces between buildings to be completely um, focused on the needs of, of people rather than vehicles. Um, and and one of the first principles of that is all about off clock car parking. So whilst there will be parking for uh, blue badge holders and for access and emergency vehicles, what what for the majority of people that will be um, using or owning cars in Northeast Cambridge, um, those cars will be stored away from their doorstep and they'll be stored in, in what we're calling car barns. Um, now that then means that you can't, you don't just jump into your car to go to the shop. Actually, you have a choice. You can either walk to the shop, which might be a five minute walk away, or you get in your car, which is a five minute walk away to then drive to, to then drive to a shop. So actually the first, the, almost like the, the, the natural choice would, would be walking and cycling um, purely by the way that the streets are designed and the fact that you're not going to have your car outside outside your outside your living room. Um, the other thing that we're really keen to do is, is encourage car share, uh, car sharing, so car clubs as well. So you know we recognise that people do need cars at times. You know if you need to do the you know weekly shop or you want to go and visit family uh, that live elsewhere. You know we're not saying that you can't have a car, but actually for a lot of people their car just sits on their driveway for a lot of the time, and and they only might need a car kind of once or twice a week. Well, that's where car sharing would be really useful for, for a number of people. Um, and that's really common now um, in a number of developments, not only in Cambridge, but elsewhere. And then the last point about, uh, I wanted to raise was about um, the fact that North East Cambridge will, we've been really conscious in, 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 in planning for this area in, in, to connect the dots really with a number of existing and future walking and cycling schemes that are coming forward. So we really want to make sure that, you know, the, the Milton Road um, GCPs, the cycle enhancement schemes, the Water Beach Greenway, which is being proposed, the Chisholm Trail, North East Cambridge will hopefully be the connector that will connect all of those um, 
existing and, and proposed schemes together. Um, so again, it, it's not just saying, you know, it's a completely disjointed uh, network for people. We're trying to really um, work with, with what's being planned to, to bring everything together so it becomes really easy for people to walk and cycle. Great, thanks, Terry. I'm still here. I've just kind of gone behind my my written name because it's probably a better way of me being able to communicate with you. It's an interesting time of night to be doing webinars. I think we've had this all the way through, so but you've got to bear with us because this is our uh, our first proper consultation during uh, during these sort of restrictions. So, then moving on to um, the next question. If there is a negative perception of high density living, it may be because of the experience at CB1, for example, where there have been problems with noise, disturbance between flats, poor inappropriate use of green space. Um, how will you manage to avoid this antisocial aspect? Um, I'm not sure who's going to pick this one up. Um, I'm happy to pick that one up, Paul. Thanks very much, John. Yeah, I mean, I think it's a really crucial thing when you start to put a lot of people in the same place, you can really kind of start to annoy each other. And I think we've been really careful in the kind of policies to think about how you um, kind of layer up different uses. So it's not only is it about kind of um, kind of residential to residential, but it's also all of those other uses like office, business uses, things like maker space, all of these sorts of things which can add to the kind of richness and vitality of a new district and so I think we will be really um, keen and you know working with environmental health colleagues to think about the kind of performance criteria for um, uh, buildings so that you don't get noise transference through the structure but also what adjacent uses are doing either above you or to the side of you um, and then I think we've been really careful looking at the size and scale of some of the open spaces and their location within the, the overall kind of um, framework to make sure that you can kind of minimize uh, the potential for kind of uh, negative use of those spaces so making sure places are active and well surveilled that they are part of kind of vital you know kind of urban and um, active districts and local centers all of these things can kind of start to help address some of those things but Again, it comes down to not only what goes in the AAP, but into the kind of future design of buildings and making sure that we have the right kind of review processes in place. We've mentioned people like the Kenchi Quality Panel helping out in terms of that peer to peer review. So again, bringing other experts in to kind of really give the place a, a good and thorough going over, I think, to help address some of the, the points raised. Thanks very much, John. Um, so, Hannah, I think you're going to pick up this next question. Um, have you considered external shading in view of the climate heating up and insulated buildings being hard to cool? I hope you're on mute. Sorry, I realised that. <laughs> um, yes, absolutely. And actually, there's a diagram in the climate change policy which talks about exactly this and all the different measures that we want to put in place for climate change. And I think there's a really interesting point here because of course nationally we're aiming towards net zero carbon by 2050. So that's a really ambitious target. And this is one of the first kind of major developments that we're going to be seeing that is absolutely addressing that head on. So it's not just about external shading, but it's also about natural ventilation, about making sure that spaces are cooled through passive means you know it's about thermal mass it's also about things like trees you know the urban heat island effect you know we talked about how important trees are for open spaces but it definitely is a climate thing as well so there's a whole range of design features that we're looking at and to jump to the last question's point about noise one of these aspects is building regulations so you know building regulations put in place requirements for things like energy performance and noise and other aspects of design performance which as planners we don't really get to influence all that much but we also know that those building regulations are going to change and adapt so a little bit like the covid thing it is about us putting an aspiration out there and also pushing government and, and making sure that we really get better standards so that we can be as demanding as possible on developers as we go forward yeah absolutely um one of the next questions i think we, we're going to get terry to pick up in is around open space and i think there's a few more down here so maybe some of these will be picked some of your questions will be answered within this um 
You've spoken about the amount of outdoor space as if it's luxurious, yet I understand it's only a total of 10 hectares, about the same size as Jesus Green in total. If there are 18,000 people living there and the space is divided into small chunks, that, that won't be much, will it? Please comment. Yep, happy to pick that one up. Uh, yeah, so as we sort of uh, mentioned in the presentation, so there will be a range of open spaces um, that we're proposing for North East Cambridge. So the 10 hectares that's referred to in the question is about new strategic open space. So that's uh, pr uh, pred predominantly the linear park which stretches from Nuffield Road allotments all the way through to Milton Country Park. So that's about a kilometre in total uh, in its length. Um, and it will also um, spur off um, over the railway line and into Chesterton Fen and then onto the River, uh, the River Cam Corridor as well. Um, there's also, as Hannah mentioned, about nine hectares of open space on the site at the moment, um, uh, which we're looking to obviously protect uh, and enhance. Um, and then there's the neighbourhood open spaces as well, which aren't shown on any of the diagrams because they would be um, they would be designed and come forward as part of a planning application for much smaller um, sort of parcels of land. Um, so in total, in terms of the public open space on the site, what the plan sets out in terms of uh, new strategic neighbourhood spaces and um, uh, retained open spaces is about 26 hectares of open space. So that's kind of the equivalent of Jesus Green and Midsummer Common combined. Um, now, in addition to that is also what I've mentioned before about the, the private the private and communal open spaces. So it's those that would be accessible to the residents within within individual blocks. Now, obviously, at this high level, we're not designing individual blocks. We're just setting out an overall kind of framework for the area. So um, so the amount of open space that would come forward in those communal spaces um, would need to be determined at a later date as part of a planning application. But nevertheless, there's still standards. Um, that those that those open spaces would need to comply with, both in terms of amenity quality um, and um, um, in terms of the space that those balconies would need to provide as well. Thanks uh, very much, sorry. Terry. Um, also, I just want to say that the plan also, sorry, um, the plan also um, um, tries to improve connectivity to, to wider areas, so Milton Country Park and the river, like I said as well, but also to existing open spaces within the city. So think about things like Nuns Way, um, and the uh, open space on Green End Road. So it's not just about new residents using those facilities, but it also allows existing residents in the area to access new facilities and then the, the wider countryside and country, country park beyond, uh, which I think is really important. Thanks, Terry. You certainly don't have to apologise for, for to providing comprehensive answers like that. That's, um, that's, that's great. Um, we've got a couple of questions that came in via email as well and I don't want to lose them because obviously they were kind of first come first served and we are getting quite a few questions coming through. I would reiterate to you that we're not going to just leave these questions unanswered so anyone that we don't get through by the end of the session today which is about another 15 minutes or so um, we will answer those questions on the website and they'll be available as well. So I think we had a couple of um, questions. One of the first being the plans are based on 20,000 new jobs with 8,000 new homes for 18,000 residents and who decided on those numbers so I'm going to stick with Terry for this one because he's our numbers man. <laughs> okay so um, thanks Paul. So um, one of the things that we did to begin with was we looked at examples from elsewhere so best practice examples from Cambridge, um, the UK and further afield as well so we've looked at places like the Netherlands and Germany and, and, and Denmark and places like that. Um, so that's in the North East Cambridge typology study. So that's available on the website. And as a planning document, as far as they go, it's actually a really easy read because there's uh, lots of pictures and it's quite easy to digest. Um, so I highly recommend reading that. What we then did, we applied those typologies, those examples to the areas and the sites that are likely to come forward within the AAP area over the next 20 years. Um, and we considered all of those against the kind of the vision for North East Cambridge to create a real mix of uses. So we didn't just look at, you know, housing developments and office developments. We looked at how we could try and apply those kind of mixed use examples within a North East Cambridge context so that we do achieve a good balance of new homes and jobs, as well as retaining existing jobs as well, which is a really important part of the plan. Um, uh, um, so, yeah. And then what we did. Um, we've, we also had to be really mindful about the HIF funding. So the HIF funding is related to the relocation of the wastewater treatment works, which is on the site at the moment. And that is obviously based on the delivery of new homes. So what we wanted to do is make sure that we didn't just provide um, loads of new office and R&D floor space, that actually we were providing um, 
a, a good range of, of homes that would enable us um, or the city council as a, as a developer in Anglia Water um, to, um, to develop the site for housing, um, but also think about addressing traffic and congestion and things like that as well as part of that, because office development actually is one of the, um, one of the worst culprits for, for people traveling by car. And actually, if you can try and create a really good balance of homes and jobs within short distance of each other that are then easy to access by foot and by bike and other modes, then actually it really helps us to, to work within the trip budget for the area. Now, um, the, the, there's quite a lot of information in the AAP and on the website about the trip budget and how we're trying to um, reduce um, car levels within the area. So I won't go into too much detail about that. But essentially, what, what we'd really like to hear your, your thoughts on is whether we've um, whether we've got the mix of uses right in North East Cambridge, um, you know, are we providing too many jobs? Are we, are we providing too many homes? Is the balance not quite right? Uh, and if so, please, please do tell us. And that's what the consultation is for, really. Yeah, that's absolutely right. So second question that came in from email is, with 15,000 jobs currently on the site, the plan means a rise to a total of 35,000 jobs. How many of the 18,000 population do you expect to fill those jobs? Um, who will fill the remaining workplaces and where will they live? I mean, that's a forward thinking question, I suppose, in the light of COVID and changes of behaviour. But John, do you want to pick this one up? Yeah, I'll give that a go, Paul. I think, yeah, COVID has kind of quite radically changed what some people's expectations are about where they live and where they work. Um, but I think the point around North East Cambridge is about creating a self-sustaining city district. And that means that you can choose to live and to work in kind of close proximity. Um, and I, I guess what's really interesting as we've been looking through some of the evidence, um, not necessarily a workplace, but Cambridge Regional College has got a catchment of uh, 50 miles. And, you know, a lot of people on, in some of these high tech businesses on the science park, again, experience kind of quite significant commutes to get to the site. And that is about affordability of accommodation relative to wages. And so the idea that you can start to deliver a lot of uh, residential units within close proximity means that people over time can make quite a, a conscious decision about where they locate. Maybe they can cut out that very long commute. So. I think, you know, we would ideally hope that everybody living there worked very locally. We can't demand that, but we can hope that, you know, that offer makes it very attractive. And then when you look at the kind of transport accessibility of the um, new district, you know, Cambridge North Station has radically changed the accessibility map for this area. So again, that and the kind of greenway projects and the other cycling and walking routes means that we can give it the best chance that people can make a sustainable mobile choice when they're trying to get to that place. And if they're living there, clearly they've got access to all of those things already. Can I just come in on that, John? Because I think there's also another really interesting point here, which is how we work with employers on the sites. And that's been really part of the AAP itself as well. So one of the types of housing that we're looking at is actually rental housing or block lease housing, which is for local employers. So the idea that actually, you know, you may be able to offer an affordable place to live to your new recruits, which is within walking and cycling distance. So that's another way that we can really help to shape this kind of very different vision here. Um, and again, this is all kind of subject to development over time. And this is a 20 year plan. So it's not all about it kind of popping up in the next five years. But we do think that this trend is, is going to be really important. People don't want to have to commute for an hour every day to get to work and different ways of living and, and working will come into play here. Yeah, it's, um, it's really important. And I think it is important to, to note that this is a long term development. It seems very now when we're consulting or something, but, you know, we are aware that, you know, things are kind of, you know, dramatically changed in the last three or four months in relation to COVID. And, and you know, it would be it would be wrong of us to even try and predict what that might mean. Um, I think to pick up on the next question that's on, on, on my list here is around some of the heritage and further evidence based work that we are doing for this particular pick particular um, plan around heritage and townscape and there are some additional pieces of, of work that we will need to be doing and they will also tie into some of the work that we're doing on a more strategic basis around the Greater Cambridge local plan because of course you know it's part of a much bigger area and you cannot view it in isolation so you know we know that there are further pieces of work and they will be forthcoming but 
all of the work we are doing is is now going up onto the website and there will be some information on there as you go forward so you can keep an eye on where things are um gonna move re really a bit more quickly now we've got about another eight minutes left um and I'll try and get through as many of these as we can really um is there flexibility in terms of the location of proposed land uses in the aap i.e the location of residential retail use in district centres. I'm not sure who's best placed to do that, maybe Terry or Hannah. Uh, yeah, I think that's a really good question. Um, so at the moment, the council is setting out what it thinks is um, the most kind of appropriate um, mix of uses and where those where those uses could go. Um, now, if you look at the, the land use plan in the in the in the AAP, it's it's quite flexible in terms of in terms of what it's saying. In, it's not just you know housing goes here and office goes here it's you know it is a real mix of uses within each of those those kind of development blocks um but again you know this this consultation is a is a really important part um of of, of sort of telling us what you think you know do you think that the plan is too flexible do you think that we should be um kind of a bit more rigid so that you know we we have a bit more certainty moving forward um or have we got the mix of uses in a particular location wrong you know do you know should we be putting other uses in in areas that we haven't really considered so you know please please do tell us your views and um yeah this this is kind of the, the, the point of the process really so yeah please tell us i think the next okay, question great. was about um cycle cycle facilities i think sarah was going to pick that up about cycle stories needs to be plentiful easy to use in the right place but tends to be an ugly ugly storage area fair enough do you have design ideas about this and will they be underground as often in the city centre? Uh, Sarah, you want like to answer that one, please? Yeah, I mean, I absolutely agree with uh, the comment that they, they need to be plentiful, easy to use uh, and in the right place. And if they're not, people just just will, will leave their cycles everywhere. We've got some really great examples um, from the continent about sort of multi-level cycle storage, um, almost cycle barns that we could think about in terms of uh, sent, uh, sort of commercial uses, but thinking about how we provide cycle parking for residents, it's really important that, um, that they are plentiful, they are well lit, they are close to where people want to be, um, and, and they feel safe and attractive to use. But it's not just about sort of how transparent they are in terms of being able to look into them to see who's there. It's also about the cycle uh, storage themselves and being able to provide cycle spaces for a range of bikes and we recognize that you know bikes come in all shapes and sizes there's a lot of off-gauge cycles in in cambridge we've got adult trikes we've got hand bikes we've we've got lots of cargo bikes so it's really important that we're designing those functional elements into buildings right at the outset so we will absolutely be pushing for state-of-the-art cycle storage Yeah, thank you, Sarah. I um, realise you haven't answered as many questions as some of the others. Um, so that's, I'm sure that there's so many here. I think that we can probably get your, your input on some of these as well. Um, I'm going to say that we're going to share some slides now that show you how you can comment on the consultation. There's been loads of really great questions and we will also post answers to any that we don't get around to on our website. So do check back there. The webinar is also going to be recorded and will be up on YouTube in probably 24 hours or so. Joe is incredibly efficient with this stuff. But please do come to any of the other webinars and also do comment on the on the consultation. So many of these points that you're making are just brilliant points. We really want to hear them. It's important that we hear what you support in our plans as well as what you think we could do differently or better. Um, and all of those comments get read and absorbed and, and will influence the shape of the plan to come. Yeah. I know that's really important and obviously a comment on the format as well because we'd be interested to hear feedback. I know it's not perfect, but it's, um, you know, it's, it's certainly something that we're getting used to doing now. Um, I'm going to do another couple of questions. I think we've got a couple more minutes. Um, you talk about multi-level development and to show sports fields on roofs, etc. If it's developed piecemeal, but there'll be no way to make thoroughfares, walkways above ground level. Will you specify floor levels and desire lines? and walkways through over Milton Road, accessible for wheelchairs, buggies at a high level and how they could be incorporated. 
Yeah, I mean, I could probably pick up some of this. I think one of the really important things about the AAP is that it's actually, whilst they are development plots and some of them will be developed out at different times, it isn't in a sense that piecemeal development where we, we are actually being really specific about the routes between different places. So there's maps and diagrams that show exactly where we are saying has to be connected to where. And through and over Milton Road is a really key one there. There are several different crossing points that we're looking to improve as part of the AAP. One is actually a bridge over, one is potentially a landscaped underpass under, and then there's also the crossing with the guided busway, which is really a, a kind of multi-way crossing, and we're looking at a very holistic way of improving that so that movement can go across in all directions and again be pedestrian oriented rather than car dominated. So we are being really specific, and I think if there are other things that you see that you think we have missed in terms of those connectivity links if you think that there are different things that we should be considering please please put them into the connectivity policy uh, questions and, and, and you know chapters into the into the consultation but we do want to make sure that all of those routes meet up logically are really intuitive to navigate and are of course accessible the wheelchair buggy point is really critical and any multi-level link that is made will have to be completely accessible for all users as well as people on bikes as well of course Right, there's a couple of short ones, a couple have been sitting on my screen for a while. So um, cannot find any reference to a waste management system for the residential and commercial properties. Uh, there is a reference. I, <laughs> I will be very glad to give it to you. Um, if you go into the consultation pages and you look at the chapter on the development process, there is actually a chapter there which is on um, digital innovation and smart, what we call sort of open innovation. And that actually talks about waste because from our perspective, things like waste collection are a point of innovation where we want to facilitate effective and, you know, if necessary, digitally driven waste management. So we are encouraging buildings to be quote unquote smart in that sense. And one of the things that we are saying it makes you a smart building is in fact incorporating a single waste collection point to facilitate efficient waste management for multi-tenanted buildings. So this is definitely something that we're looking at. We know that there's also other great examples around the place of new approaches to waste. It is a huge issue and we are addressing it. Okay, thanks, Hannah. Well, I think on that note, we are, we've hit seven o'clock and we've got, still got quite a few questions left. What I'm going to try and do is I'm going to try and put my video on just for this final section. It feels strange because I feel like my video's not and I can't see you, even though I can't anyway. Um, we'd just really like to thank you for all coming along. I'd like to thank all of the panel and officers who have been working on this. Um, and please, please, please in, in, um, complete the feedback survey once the Q&A is closed um, and also, you know, comments on both the Q&A, the format and obviously, of course, on the actual consultation itself. It's open for another few weeks. And as Hannah said, there's another two live webinar sessions um, coming up in the next couple of weeks, too. Um, but thank you for all coming. Thank you to the panel. And I hope you all have a lovely rest of your evening. I'm sorry for the cockerel noises and the chicken noises in my background. Um, but that's just the way we work nowadays, isn't it? Um, have a lovely evening, everybody. <laughs>